Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this morning's webinar. I'm Steve Holloway, the president of the Energy Institute. Uh, I was hoping today I was going to be feeling uh, not as fresh as I do feel, but uh, the celebrations last night were somewhat curtailed, weren't they? But thanks for joining us this morning, uh, because this is a, an annual event for us where we publish our Energy Barometer Survey Report. And this year it's got a particular focus, and it's called the Net Zero Skills Issue, for obvious reasons. Of course, this year, as we approach COP26 and the UK aims to inspire the global community as we want to lead by example, our report today, I think, sends a very powerful message from our members across the mixture of the energy world, the professionals that run our energy industry. And they've revealed their views as they do it each year and their fears about the skills that are needed. But they're offering clear encouragement to government and, and to the companies in the industry to coalesce around a national skills strategy that underpins the development of our low carbon energy and supply chains across the economy. And as we've all been talking during the course of the last 18 months on many webinars, also very, very clearly wanting to pursue this in a just way that doesn't leave today's skilled workers and indeed their communities stranded. But before we come on to discuss those findings a little bit further, let me just for those who aren't so familiar, explain what the Energy Institute is. Because the Energy Institute is the global chartered membership body for people who work in and around energy. Today, we work with over 20,000 members and 200 companies in 120 countries. We date back more than a century. It's a unique independent network that truly spans the world of energy. I'm always delighted to talk about the fact that we, st we still have such an important part to the role to play in representing me members in the oil and gas industry. But today that's less than half of the membership with members from solar, from wind, from storage, from technology businesses, a real reflection of the energy world in which we live in today. And the Institute convenes and facilitates debate, champions evidence, very keen to make sure we're constantly sharing fresh ideas and giving voice to issues of concern. And when necessary, holding the mirror up and challenging the industry that we work with. Our professionals, our members, are all ages, genders, backgrounds, and disciplines. And they're looking to the Institute, they're looking to us for the knowledge, the skills, and good practice to help them develop their careers in what's obviously a vital and fast developing field. Now, I'm delighted this morning to be joined by two fellow speakers who are fantastically qualified on the issues in question. The first of those is Professor Rob Gross. Rob has been the director of the Energy Research Centre based at UCL since March 2020. He's also at Imperial College and alongside his teaching experience, he's published extensively on energy policy and technology and is a regular source of advice to select committees, government, departments, public bodies and on conference platforms. Rob is a fellow and a trustee of the Energy Institute and chairs the committee that oversees the barometer survey each year. I'm also joined this morning by Rianne Kelly, who's been with National Grid since 2017 and is now responsible for all the corporate affairs activities on behalf of the company's UK regulated businesses and its wider com commercial activities in the UK. I know Rianne from the past when she was the director of infrastructure at the CBI, so she's been around this space for a long time. She obviously has a passion for politics and she is a member of, of the uh, Green Jobs task force that was set up and chaired by ministers on this very subject last year. And of course, it's due to make its latest set of recommendations very soon. So a few words about why this report matters. You know, I, I think I say this every year on the barometer, but energy professionals are a pretty hard headed bunch of people. You know, they, 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 they don't say things that unless they firmly believe them and they believe there's evidence. You know, they're fundamentally, unsurprisingly, engineers, technicians, scientists, and, and, and economists. And we're all driven by evidence 
in terms of the practicalities of what it takes to keep this industry going day in and day out. And of course, society benefits enormously from the work of everybody in this industry. But it also means, I think, why people like to see the barometer. They understand this is going to say something from people who know what they're talking about. And certainly in my time with the Institute, I think you know, the publication of the barometer has got more attention year on year because it's based on a survey of real professionals. More than 400 professionals selectively picked to make sure we've got the representation across all of the industry. So it does go from renewables to oil and gas, to energy efficiency, from fellows of the Institute to associate members to those really early in their careers. And this year it's, it's presented as an interactive page as well. So you can explore some of these issues in some detail. So after a short presentation on the findings this morning, and we're gonna have a Q&A session. So please post your questions in the chat function as we go along. You don't need to wait to the end at all. If you could state your name and your affiliation, and I assure you that, that we'll try and get to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Please also do tweet your thoughts. Uh, tag at Energy Institute and hashtag Energy Barometer or post it on LinkedIn because we'd like very much to hear from you all. But before we move to the skills issue, I'm just gonna outline the key findings of, of, of the barometer this year. I'm just getting the right slide up, thank you. So the past year has obviously been extraordinarily challenging and eventful. It's interesting what do professionals see as the greatest challenges that are facing us in the year ahead. And I don't think these results will be a huge surprise to anybody. COVID-19 looming was there last year, uh, but looming right at the very, very top of the pile this, this year. And of course, there's so many consequences from that, the unprecedented drop in energy demand. BP issued their annual report and their annual sort of energy scenarios um, an update last week. You know, unprecedented drop in energy demand, particularly in oil and gas around the world. But despite that, in the UK here, our grid has been the greenest it's ever been. You'll all have seen you know, regularly new coal free days and renewable records being hit. But as we emerge from lockdown, things are quite clearly still very uncertain. And there's never been a bigger need for investment in low carbon projects and technology. But at the same time, that's going on as, as the global economy slows down. And with high government spending and, and high government debt, as people support, it's a huge challenge to how we support the transition and, and coming out of COVID-19. Unsurprisingly, other top challenges that are there year on year, energy policy, climate change and sustainability, which includes net zero targets. And, and you'll see that, you know, a big jump this year, investment and costs coming up and people and skills. So the, the focus of this year's survey for us, but in the general questions, people and skills jumping up from last year in ninth place on the list of biggest challenges into the top five but more on that particular issue in a moment. Let me mention the uh, other couple of trends over time. If we look at the shift to low carbon technologies and the policies to support them, survey respondents are cautiously po positive on, on policy advances. Interestingly, this, is, this has been a theme over recent years, I think that cautious optimism almost. Over two thirds feel that UK policy has had a positive effect on supporting renewable electricity and emerging technology research and innovation. And respondents are feeling much more positive this year about policy support for hydrogen and CCUS. That's not the same commentary though on fuel poverty with only 18% being positive. Uh, and energy efficiency policy, 42%. It's been declining every year since this survey actually began. If I look at conventional fuels on the next chart, uh, sentiment appears to be hardening. Energy professionals who support new licensing of fossil fuel development are now in a, a majority. The energy professionals 
in a minority supporting new development in the UK. New coal mining attracts the least overt support at 12%, followed by shale gas development at 25%. I forget that what that was a few years ago, but I think it was well over 50%. Uh, offshore oil and gas, 36%, and new fired, new gas fired power generation at 40 3%. So aligning very much, I think, with the government announcements to move up the phase out of unabated coal-fired power generation and reflecting the inevitable shift in our energy system as we reconcile existing technologies with our longer term goals. And what does the overall decarbonisation picture look like? Well, we asked again about our, our climate targets and asked again uh, survey participants to express their confidence as to whether we'd be hitting the target, exceeding the target, et cetera. And this chart shows you those results. If you look at our fifth carbon budget, of course, which is, which is to get a 57% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, there's a pretty even split actually between those who believe that the UK will meet or even exceed that budget and those who believe that will fall short. That's a fairly consistent picture since 2019, actually. A pretty much an even split between uh, those who are even more optimistic and those who just are skeptical about our ability to uh, hit the targets. The members are less confident about the UK meeting its 2050 net zero target, with just 12% thinking that the UK will meet or exceed it. And of course, that's also a target that's changed as well. So when we look back over previous years, we've got now a more ambitious net zero target. Um, and yet people, the vote of those who think we'll actually get to our 2050 has been pretty static over recent years. So but still 12%, a pretty low number. So with those are really headline figures about how people are feeling about the changes in the industry, how people are feeling about our ability to hit the targets. Let me hand over to Rob Gross to move into the meat of this year's barometer, which we really want to talk about this morning the net zero skills issue. So Rob, over to you. Okay, hi there everybody. Steve, can you hear me all right? Yes, Give I me can. a thumbs up. Yep. Great yep. stuff, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so I've just got uh, a few slides uh, that are focused in on the findings uh, from this year's barometer. As Steve has already uh, mentioned, we decided to ask members specific, every year we have a particular focus uh, of, uh, of our kind of focused questions as well as our standing uh, background questions if you like and so this year we decided we needed to focus that would be interesting to focus that on the um, the skills issues uh, and the reskilling and changing nature um, of the energy industry um, as, as we move towards uh, net, net zero. Um, Steve's also already mentioned uh, the Green Jobs Task Force, and we're going to hear a bit more about that later. Uh, but the thing that the Energy Institute is able to do uh, uniquely is to ask uh, energy professionals questions about how the net zero transition and other changes to the energy system affect them personally. So it's the, the impact on their professional lives and, and also on their communities, which I'll, I'll come to at the end of my slides. So it's, it's worth bearing in mind, of course, that the Energy Institute membership base is already quite diverse in terms of career background. So some of the people that we're asking would already be working in the low carbon uh, arena, and that's increasingly the case. Uh, but you've got quite an interesting split uh, on pie chart that you can see uh, on the slide there around who's uh, expecting to, to move into uh, a, a different kind of uh, nature of job as the energy industry changes and just over half 52 percent think that they will either have or expect in some way uh, to be uh, moving uh, and uh, just under half uh, see themselves as being a bit more settled and obviously of those uh, a significant proportion are already likely to be working in low carbon or energy efficiency uh, provision. I think it's uh, th th there's a there's a positive aspect to that there's new opportunities uh, it's also important, I think, that, that, that we recognise that for, for some energy professionals, this is a cause for concern. It's worth noting that 10% of respondents uh, expressed, you know, sort of, sort of concern about the changes towards net zero, worrying about negative impacts on their careers, uh, increased uncertainty or, or, and so on. And, 
as you might expect, that uh, is a particular feature of energy professionals working in, in the fossil fuel uh, industries. Uh, ne next slide, please. So we moved on to ask some questions around uh, the skills strategy that's needed um, in order to deliver the net zero aspirations. Um, our thinking about this uh, came from two directions, uh, really. Uh, one is that there's an absolute requirement for new skills because people will simply be needed in large numbers to, uh, whether it's uh, you know, building new supply side technologies like offshore wind farms or, or doing the kind of real whole home retrofits, uh, heat pump installations and all of those kinds of things. Uh, that will be, need, be needed uh, on, on the sort of demand side of the equation, um, but also that we need to help people to reskill so that we can take them, they can come with us uh, on this journey towards uh, net zero. So about well, exactly half of respondents want to see more action from the industry, from their sector, and around about three, three quarters uh, want more action on skills in terms of skills strategy uh, from, from the government. So that's important to emphasize that specifically government attention to skills, uh, not just government attention to, to wider energy policy, uh, which we're gonna come on to uh, now. So next slide, please. Um, and the, when we asked about this uh, question of the balance of effort uh, from policymakers uh, to build uh, long-term uh, net zero capacity within the, the UK workforce, um, there's two, there's a kind of push and pull requirement here. So, so one is that you know, the energy policy needs to provide the incentives that drive the transition and drive the change. So that's the kind of pull. Uh, and then the push is the provision of those, uh, helping to provide those skills, those re the retraining and strategic approach to be skilling uh, that's needed uh, in order to take the transition forward and provide the skills that are needed uh, in order to deliver that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Historically, the Energy Institute has been a, a, a pretty sort of engineering and science uh, dominated institution, uh, but that's been but the, the kind of career pathways and the nature of professional roles that are represented in the Energy Institute has become more and more diverse. Uh, so it's interesting to note that even though not, not all of the professionals working in, in the Energy Institute come from a kind of what we call STEM, science, technology and engineering uh, background, it still comes out as the, one of the key enablers and one of the key requirements uh, in order to, to, to kind of you know, bring in uh, right down to the, the kind of school age children and through to reskilling uh, during the career path. Engineering and technical skills are, are hugely important, um, but increasingly um, whole system thinking. So understanding the interactions across sectors, for example, uh, and having a, a view of the kind of wider changes that we're going to need to our infrastructure uh, and our energy system across the piece uh, as we move to basically transform the energy system in, in response to the net zero challenge. Next slide. Um, part of the, the whole story, and it's a hugely important focus of the Energy Institute's uh, work um, and, and those of, of, of the, the, the organisations that people work within, uh, including the, the, the university sector, for example, where I work and, and many others, uh, is actually thinking about how we enable the, the career paths to be more representative of the society at large, and in particular, how to improve uh, the prospects for those from underrepresented groups um, in, in, in securing successful careers in the energy industry. And we've got some uh, responses to the questions uh, there that you can see on the slide. Um, I think the first most important that came through from the survey was actually family flexible uh, work, family friendly flexible working, uh, enabling that kind of career path opportunity for both women and men. Uh, for example, by improving uh, paternal uh, paternity leave and so on, so that that the burden can be more evenly shared as people go through those family years. Uh, and to improve overall diversity in the, in the workforce. Uh, next slide. And then I think this is my last slide, although I quite often think it's my last slide and get that bit wrong. Uh, we also focused on the fact that 
communities, uh, professionals aren't just in a community of professionals, but they're also within a community, uh, a home community, within a community of individuals. Um, and a particular reason for asking questions in this area is that some energy professionals will work in particular geographies that historically might have been dominated by particular industries by, for example, energy intensive uh, in industrial areas or indeed the extractive uh, sector, uh, you know, the area of the cluster around Aberdeen, for example, that was historically associated with North Sea oil and gas. And so if we are to make a just transition, we need to bring these communities um, uh, of people as well as communities of professionals um, along uh, with us. And perhaps slightly slightly troubling slide there because um, the, the indication is that actually the energy professionals overall uh, feel that we need to do a great deal more to engage with and involve uh, the, the, the communities that will be affected by the changes uh, that, that, uh, that are before us. Um, and so I think that's certainly something where, where we would hope to see a bit more attention and effort paid. But the, the kind of reskilling journey is obviously an important part of, um, uh, of, of, uh, of a just transition for those communities as well. I think that's it from me. It is good. Over, over to Rian. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Just checking that everybody can hear me and uh, everybody can see me great thank you very much get, get the thumbs up so thanks very much everybody for for having me um, I'm really pleased to be here and to have the chance to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing at National Grid on green jobs and skills um, and including our membership of the government's green jobs task force as you all probably know uh, National Grid is an energy company operating in the UK and the US we deliver electricity and gas safely reliably and efficiently to our customers and communities um, but we also do this while working towards a clean energy future. Um, our UK business um, owns and operates electricity and gas transmission networks or energy motorways in England and Wales and just gas for Scotland. And this gives us a unique position at the heart of um, Britain's energy system. And we think then that in the post pandemic world, we have a huge opportunity to reset the economy and unlock hundreds of thousands of skilled and purpose led green jobs in the coming years. But um, I guess what what do we mean by uh, green job? Probably very familiar to all of you, but um, I think green jobs are those that will help sectors transition to low carbon models and contribute to environmental goals. Um, so it ranges from things like civil, mechanical, electrical engineers to data analysts, machine learning experts, skilled tradespeople, as well as maybe some of the things that people more more naturally come to mind. So roles linked to electric electric vehicles, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage. So what I wanted to do today is firstly, I'm going to share some of the research that we've done at National Grid into the scale of the opportunity. Secondly, talk about some of the commitments that we have made as a business to build the net zero energy workforce. And then finally, I wanted to touch a little bit on the role of government and the work of the Green Jobs Task Force. So if you flick the slide on one, um, at the start of 2020, we published a report entitled Building the um, Net Zero Energy Workforce. And what we found is that in the energy sector, we need to recruit something in the region of 400,000 jobs by 2050, with about 117,000 of these needed between now and 2030, if we're to meet our net zero targets. These roles, as the slide shows, are spread right across every nation and region of the UK and present a rather significant opportunity to tackle some of the regional um, inequalities currently present across the economy. So for example, the expansion of offshore wind and workforce attrition in the Northwest will mean about 60,000 roles will be needed to be filled. And then in the Northeast, uh, Yorkshire and Humber, we'll need to recruit something like 40,000 more jobs to deliver offshore wind, carbon capture and storage and support uh, decarbonized industries. And then um, in Scotland, uh, with the continued growth of onshore um, and offshore wind, we'll need something in the region of 50,000 jobs. So hopefully that gives you um, some sense of the scale of the opportunity. But I also I guess also um, the scale um, of the challenge in tackling the current skills deficit. And one of the things I think we really need to address as part of this, as Robert has picked up on, is um, diversity. Um, 
put pretty simply, um, we're not going to fill these roles and meet our net zero targets unless we can attract those who maybe so far have not actually considered a role in the energy sector. So this is going to mean attracting a more diverse talent from across the UK, especially women, those from ethnic minority groups and lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And it's going to require collaboration between governments at all levels, trade unions and businesses. But I also think that said, there's a really important role uh, for responsible and purposed organisations like National Grid to play in being a pathfinder to help uh, find solutions to some of these challenges. And one of the things that we have done, which I just wanted to share a little bit, is our responsible business charter. So if you go to the next slide. So in the autumn of last year, we, we published our responsible business charter, which is our articulation of what responsibility means to us at National Grid. And in the charter, we identified where we can have the most impact on society across five areas, the environment, um, communities we serve, our people, the economy and our governance. And so we were able um, to make commitments. So we said we would achieve 50% diversity in our senior leadership group and in all our new talent programmes by 2025 and 50% diversity in our group executive committee. Um, but also, I guess, whilst setting targets is really important, we also at the same time need to make sure we're providing young people with access to opportunities and skills, regardless of their circumstances or background, to ensure that we have our diverse talent pipeline too. So that's why we've committed to developing skills for the future with a focus on lower income communities by providing access uh, to skills development of 45,000 people by 2030 and achieving 500,000 employee volunteering hours by 2030. And to do this, we've established Grid for Good, which is an energy industry community programme led by us to support socioeconomically disadvantaged young people aged 16 to 25. And it aims to connect um, the most overlooked and hardest to reach uh, young people in the UK and the US with training and employment opportunities to help them with careers, skills and career development. It's running virtually at the moment, but we have a 12 week career mentoring, two weeks paid work experience and access to apprenticeships and internships at National Grid. In addition, though, to this, um, we also have big infrastructure projects and we recognise that we probably need to engage in the local communities around those projects as well. So one of the examples is um, London Power Tunnels, which is a tunnel we are digging under southern London. Um, and we have teamed up with a social enterprise called My Kind of Future, and we're targeting 100,000 secondary school pupils with STEM-based upskilling opportunities to the most disadvantaged schools, colleges and young people within the eight London boroughs that are impacted by the project. So I, I, I wanted to share this because I think it shows um, the positive role that we can play as businesses um, helping to um, build um, green skills and make the transition to the net zero uh, targets. But my final slide then picks up on uh, the Green Jobs Task Force. And I was delighted to be asked to join the Green Jobs Task Force. It's a joint initiative between Bayes and the Department for Education with interesting representation from business, uh, the education sector, trade unions, academia, and it's looking to address some of the key challenges associated with unlocking green jobs in the short to medium term as part of the green economic recovery. And I think forums like the Green Jobs Task Force have been really interested, really interesting in bringing together quite a diverse and broad range of representatives. And I think the task force itself is quite an important role to play in trying to articulate what more we can do to support green jobs and skills. And throughout the life cycle of the task force, um, there's been three key themes that I've been stressing to officials and ministers. Firstly, from a talent pipeline perspective, there's a big focus on engaging uh, young people to inspire them to study STEM subjects or look at opportunities in the energy sector. And I've already touched a little bit on the role that business can play here. But I think we need to be thinking carefully about how we engage with teachers, parents and guardians to ensure that they also understand the quality of green collar jobs given the huge impact they can have on the sort of choices that people make about their careers. So we've been saying that dialogue with this, these groups must be ramped up if we're to get to the young minds who I think are going to be so important to helping us uh, manage uh, and tackle climate change. And secondly, then, we've also been saying if we look at the current workforce, more needs to be done to map out where we can repurpose skills um, and also to enable this shift to begin. So training on the job is pretty important 
in part of um, the suite of solutions um, to support not only the just transition, but also refocus skill sets towards net zero roles. And crucial, of course, to all of this is funding. Financial backing is going to be needed to enable uh, businesses to support this form of training. And one option that could have a significant impact would be the reform of the apprenticeship levy, allowing greater flexibility for business to direct unspent money to, to be raised by the levy. And this could include modular um, upskilling. And finally, then, um, there's those net zero jobs, the future linked directly to key uh, crucial net zero technologies. So carbon capture and storage and hydrogen are always front of the mind, not only for their green job creation benefits, but also the potential to protect existing jobs within in energy intensive sectors and industries. And so we have been saying um, to the government that to get these technologies off the ground, we need long term policy certainty from government, as reflected in the barometer, really, and milestones like the soon to be expected hydrogen strategy, the net zero strategy, the heat and building strategy, they're going to be really important for the business community in driving um, investment needed to underpin our net zero targets. So let me just draw all this to sort of um, a, a conclusion. Um, we think it's a huge opportunity um, uh, for green jobs to emerge from the economy as we uh, start to recover from the pandemic. And we should be doing all we can then to make sure it's a green economic recovery, not just an economic recovery, and a green economic recovery that drives jobs and investment across every region and nation in the UK. We're going to, to do this, we're going to need to transform our energy system for clean technologies, whilst making sure that at the same time, we lever leverage this shift to maximise green jobs and skills. I think we're going to need to see a shift from talking about tackling green skills to actively building the capabilities we need across the country. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I think back to you, Steve. Thanks, Rian. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rian, and, and, and you, Rob, as well. Um, I'm, I'm keen to get on. We've got some questions coming in already. Um, just, and just to remind you, please post your questions in, in the chat box there. So let me start off, actually. I mean, the first one in um, was from Vidit Patel, actually. Uh, not about skills, but will there be an adequate carbon pricing policy in place to discourage the use of fossil fuels in the UK? Well, did it, uh, you know, you're probably aware, but you know, we, we, we separated from the European ETS scheme, of course, due to Brexit at the beginning of the year. So the UK introduced its own carbon trading scheme then in May this year. The last time I looked, our prices were higher than the rest of Europe as well, which was interesting. So, so that is in place, but of course, that's not, that's not for all of industry. That's just for heavy fuel users and the power sector at the moment. But, the, but there's no question that's been driving a lot of change the question for the government which i certainly can answer is you know when do you extend that in, into other uses but it's certainly it, the price of the, the last time i looked the price was 50 pounds a ton actually so having certainly a, a pretty big impact for sure i don't know whether you've got anything to add on that at all rob yeah i can um i can speak to i could probably speak to you for the rest of the morning about carbon pricing uh, but I'll resist the temptation to do that. So I think obviously uh, what many of us would hope um, is that in, in the fullness of time, uh, the, the new UK ETS will either uh, uh, reconnect to the, to the wider European ETS, which will uh, give us a kind of, you know, more liquid and uh, larger market uh, place uh, and or connect to uh, another large trading block that has a, an emissions trading scheme. Um, it's encouraging to see that the carbon pricing uh, ha the carbon prices through ETS uh, across Europe have gone up, uh, which obviously provides more of an incentive. And Steve's quite right that it needs to be uh, uh, pushed across a wider set of sectors in the economy. Um, but uh, the thing that I always emphasise in, in this conversation is that carbon pricing is not the, the, the only, I hate using the golfing analogy, I don't play golf, uh, but it's a one club golfers approach to think that we have to do everything through a carbon price. And in actual fact, I think it's a misunderstanding of the challenge that we face to get overly preoccupied with the carbon price. Uh, we've been talking this morning about the extent to which this is a skills challenge. That's got nothing to do with the carbon price, or at least it's quite tangential. The role of the carbon price is a long string, very far away, pulling on those uh, jobs. It's a supply chain challenge uh, that needs to be enabled. Um, more than anything else, though, it's an infrastructure challenge. And big infrastructure requires very different policy levers in order to enable it uh, than just uh, increasing the carbon price. So we've seen, for example, in, in electricity, that providing long-term fixed price contracts uh, that give investors security 
has been hugely uh, effective and running auctions have been very successful at driving down the prices of those con contracts. That's been a hugely successful way of driving changes to the, uh, the electricity mix. And that's not a proxy carbon price, that's a different type of policy instrument. And similarly, in most of the end use sectors, uh, we've seen that regulation has been extremely effective at driving uh, improvements in the efficiency of the devices that we use. And, and those that the labeling that we have on our domestic appliances, the A's and B's and C's and so on, that's just been revamped. So all of your, uh, you buy a TV and you thought you were going to get an A star and all of a sudden it's been demoted to a C, which will continue to drive improvement. But boiler efficiency, uh, vehicle efficiency, building regulations and appliance efficiency have all been hugely important. So uh, carbon prices, could they be higher? Yes. Uh, could they extend to more uh, wider range of sectors? Yes. Are they all we need to do? No. Thanks, Rob. Right. Um, that's, there's a few questions come in on skills and things as well. So let me get on to that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take these not in the order they came in, but in a, I hope what is, is an order that makes a little bit of sense here. Um, so, Rianne, I mean, all the work the National Grid did here, there's a question here from Sebastian Belcher, you know, what are the major skills that are lacking now within the energy industry itself? It's a really good question. Um, one of the things that, and I'll give you one example, one of the things that we're looking at is data and data analysts and how do we use data and sort of how do we get more digital? And I think they are not typically skills that we might have associated, but we are looking now to bring them into National Grid as we evolve for the, for the, for the net zero future. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the sorts of skills that we're going to have to basically bring people into the energy sector. Yeah, I mean, in fact, if, if I may just add to that, you know, one of, one of the, the fantastic things that I enjoy um, being the president of the Energy Institute is when I go to one of the young members events then half the people there are data scientists actually today almost you know so they're already in the industry there's no no question in all the new companies that are coming on here but i think you're right it's going to be a huge injection there as well as of course uh the old skills that you refer to or the old disciplines that you refer to in terms of stem and everybody on the call i suspect will be very familiar with the fact that you know we've been we've been talking about the stem shortage in the uk for a very very long time my optimism actually is that the green jobs opportunity and the task force are just going to shine a light on that yet again, actually, which, which gets us into some of the education questions here. That are Steve, coming. could I just could I add something on, on, on yeah, in response to, to that question, which draws on uh, some of the UKIRK uh, research findings that was uh, undertaken by some of my colleagues at the University of Edinburgh. Um, we often get very sort of focused on the high, the high end of the skills, you know, the, the kind of PhD engineer that's helping to design an offshore wind farm. Um, what we also need to remember is that there's a huge reskilling that's necessary at, um, at the level of people that are providing the, the, the whole home retrofits to people's houses that are going to be needed. So what we're talking about here is um, central heating engineers, uh, the plumbing, plumbing trade, uh, general builders. Uh, because we're going to need to improve the energy efficiency of our homes uh, and we're going to need to change the way that we provide the, in particular, the heating systems in our homes. Um, and if we look at other countries that are further ahead with some of those journeys than we are, for example, in the installation of heat pumps, um, one of the key things that, that they went through uh, in the early days of their transition uh, was poorly installed installations and, and problems with, uh, with lack of skills on, on the part of the workforce. So we don't have to repeat their mistakes. And Thank so we all. need that certification and training and that kind of whole home approach is, is going to be a huge challenge for the next decade. Yeah. So there's some great questions or, you know, almost observations coming in here. So one from Alex Sutherland here, which I think just, just to build on what you're saying, Rob, looking at the examples of Bifab and other supply chain in the UK, the Green Revolution promise is shown up empty. There are an estimated 80,000 traditional engineers out of work in the UK. Uh, so, of course, there's been a cynicism here from Alex about how can you state that the green jobs are out there already but unable to find work? And that's, you know, that's, I, I guess that's your point here about, we, you know, the, 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 the retraining of traditional engineers in just those new technologies and the need to get on with that really quickly. Sorry, was that for me? Yeah, I mean, what's, what, what are you talking about on the task force are we in? is that point already come up but which is what i was raising is there's you know there are engineers that aren't even in work today who could be re retrained so 
uh, why are totally, we getting with it? Totally, and in many ways, that I think was the sort of the, the the one of the reasons the task force was created is exactly what is what is it that we all can do to support um, pulling through people the engineers out of work today as well as recognizing that there's a there's a whole life cycle to this that we're going to need to deal and we're going to need to pick through all eight stages of the life cycle um and i, and I guess that the, the sort of to reiterate the point i said said if we're going to have an economic recovery let's make it a green economic recovery so let's make sure that we can get to traditional engineers and reskill um and i think some of the some of the the thinking that's been doing it, it we've done is not just you know how do you pull through students in stem but it's exactly this what are the things that we can do today and in the future to retrain and reskill both in for people in work and out of work so and from an industry perspective what is it we and organizations like national grid should be doing so and the, the task force will come out in the in the next um a next couple of week next week or so so um do look out for it right well we are looking out well for that for sure there's two there are two questions in here um you know, pretty much the same about, you know, is there is there a resistance for the, the new energy industry to take oil and gas workers that want to transition? And a question for Brian Morshaw, again, rather an observation, that a lot of people have left or want to leave the traditional oil and gas industries are finding it hard to get a foot in renewables where there's no experience, you know, the old favourite, we don't have any experience in this area. Uh, and that includes people who are happy to self-invest in their own, own training. I mean, I guess my answer to, to those questions is, you know, this is exactly why, why we're doing this webinar this morning to a certain extent and all the work that the Green Jobs Task Force is doing. And certainly we think the Energy Institute's got a massive role to play in here with all of our member companies in particular, thinking about how they begin to train their employees for, for this, 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 this transition. Uh, and certainly in all my conversations with the oil and gas companies, I think there's a real understanding of what, not just what they need for their own resources, but the obligation they have as on the, for employees who've got 20 years of working life left still to retrain them for all the new industries. But your observations about it's not clearly working well at the moment, I guess, aren't altogether surprising. Richard Watson talks about um, this, this is expensive for employers. Um, you mentioned uh, the apprenticeship levy, Rianne. Um, initiatives such as apprenticeship schemes being open to existing workforce help with this, but some of other costs that people have to bear. Um, you know, he asked whether organisations such as the ERA are influencing the government. I mean, I, I think we're not a lobby organisation, Richard, to be clear. And that's not what we do, but we certainly represent the views of members in the industry. So we take every opportunity when we're certainly hosting and facilitating uh, discussions with government around this you know you'll see that the energy minister actually is is quoted on the press release associated with the barometer today so you know we'll we be taking her through the barometer findings in some amount of detail so all those things are uh, opportunities to influence but it's, it's not our primary role um, but you're absolutely right i mean i do lots of other things beside the energy institute and i th i think the rewiring of the uh, of the levy is a massive opportunity isn't it Rian? yes i totally agree with that and i but just to pick up on the the, the, the question as well um about additional employees and um, um productivity loss as people retrain one of the things we are likely to say in the green jobs task force is that it is incumbent on organizations where they can to allow employees time to retrain so as well as making the apprenticeship levy more flexible and supporting a sort of modular approach i think we 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 will need to think through how do we give people time off to do the retraining and it, it may well be and I, I can probably hear richard saying fine for some and not for others but we're going to need to work through that yeah i mean just to just just to add to that um it's quite important that you uh, uh particularly from a public policy perspective um, to distinguish between problems that are essentially structural um, and problems that uh, and issues that might be within the within the, the reach of individual particular companies or individuals. So there's the, there's there's kind of structural mismatches between where we're going to be in the future and where we are now. Uh, and those the, the kind of structural mismatches that I'm talking about, that they, they might be ge geographical because there'll be ge geographical shifting around uh, in terms of, uh, of the energy landscape. Uh, and there'll be parts of um, parts of the country and parts of the world that have been that will be you know disadvantaged by this, and those communities need to be 
helped uh, to transition. Uh, there's also geographical dimensions already because other near neighbor countries have developed some of the skills base and the supply chain that's, that's, that, that's, that delivers this transition already ahead of us and are therefore better placed in a competitive marketplace, for example, in offshore wind, where there's very, very strong pressure, downward cost pressure uh, uh, to, to be able to offer all of the kind of, you know, quality assurance and guarantees that will be needed by somebody that's contracting for the delivery of, of a very complex project. Um, than some of our, you know, local local companies might be able uh, might be able to do, and there's other kind of you know structural issues that are in the kind of you know the nature of the kind of existing skills base and the nature of the economy that are actually quite difficult for individuals or individual companies to fix, and so what we need to avoid is a kind of misunderstanding of the problem that then almost seems like blaming of either individual companies or individuals for things that are completely out with uh, their control. And that's where you need enlightened public policy because enlightened public policy needs to recognize the, the structural issues uh, and this kind of structural cha changes and to proactively uh, take steps to try and fix those. Um, and I think that this, these kind of raft of questions that we can see in the chat that are around uh, you know, the time taken, the cost of the need for um, the, the reskilling are, or, or indeed the kind of unemployed individuals that can't find a route to, uh, to, to the jobs, even though there are unfilled jobs, uh, they're all manifestations of that. So it's kind of, you know, the requirement is for, for, for at the very highest level for policymakers to actually understand and respond to that kind of structural need for change. Thanks, Rob. Uh, just to pick up, there were two questions in from Rachel Jordan Evans, who's obviously an HR professional, as she says in her question here. So, uh, first point was was a point actually that, in her own experience, um, she's been pretty shocked by the fact that some organisations are rejecting the candidates from the legacy oil and gas companies, as uh, which was a comment that was made by somebody else. And just for the avoidance of doubt, I've noted those. I'm going to need to go away and think about that because that's. You know, it's completely counter to everything that this is talking about, everything everybody else is talking about, in a sense. And Rachel has another question here. I'm just scrolling down, bear with me here. So if, if, if the perception is that existing engineers don't have the requisite skills, it's key there's a gap analysis, because uh, it's pure perception. But, you know, I think there has been quite a bit of work done on skills matrices. Is, isn't that part of what the task force is doing, Rianne? Yes, absolutely part of what the task force is doing. And there's a, there's a bit of um, don't invent, reinvent the wheels. I think there's plenty out there. The question is, can we pull it all together and then sensibly use it and agree it and, and work from it? So that part of, I think, what the task force will want to do is more pulling of that, to, pulling together and then um, uh, having a sort of more coherent picture. Because at the moment, I think it exists in lots of different pockets and there's not one view. So I think that the going forwards it would be helpful if we had sort of a, a sort of more holistic and agreed view that we could all work from yep thank you there was a question from eduard guita uh, what will it take to reskill a petroleum engineer working in the upstream sector or a chemical engineer in the downstream sector what functions could they perform going forward and i think you know, that's part of what the matrix is going to show clearly uh, and, it's, and it's also an area where I'm hopeful that the EI is going to play quite a role for our members because we are a membership organisation. So, you know, be able to get the matrices together and be, help people think through the reality, in my view, where it's an enormous amount of the skills that people have already. It's just some new knowledge and, and some new skills that need adding to it. You know, it's not a complete reskilling here. We, I think we need to be a bit careful almost with the word reskilling because it kind of implies to some people, a complete 100% change, which I don't think is what we're really talking about. And so many of these jobs here, you know, we, we already have a number of members who, who I have met who've moved out of the oil and gas sector into the offshore wind sector. And of course, you know, they're using 90% of their old, old skills um, in a sense. That's certainly an area where, where we intend to play a part to help as well. Look, you know, this is quite interesting, these people who are uh, feeling, you know, left out so we have to really think quite hard about that but but let me ask you Rob and Rianne if you can I mean just how heavy-handed do you think the government are going to need to be you know which I'm always intrigued with the barometer every year where people sort of want more more policy it's almost as if 
you know, we want more direct intervention from government in this space here. You know, is, is this about setting up a framework or do you think the government need to get really heavy handed on some of the companies to make sure that they are really investing in this? What's your view, Rob? Um, I'm not sure how heavy handed they need to be uh, with individual companies. Um, I, I, I think uh, there's a kind of a, a kind of kind of higher level answer to that question, which is that this is an unprecedented, the ambitious thing to try and do in an incredibly short space of time. So when you look at the kind of his, historical sort of time duration of transitions that we've seen uh, in the energy industry in the past, you know, whether it's the kind of long term shift from wood to coal to oil and gas, a bit of nuclear coming in on the supply side, um, whether it's the switch over from from town gas to natural gas, uh, you know, which which took a decade, by the way, at a time when which was which, which you would think was a relatively straightforward thing to do. A repurposing took a decade at a time when half but, but half the level of penetration of, of, of central heating uh, that we have on the system uh, now. So. Everything that the government needs to do is going to have to be more ambitious uh, across the piece than anything they've ever countenanced doing in the energy sector before. And I think that that needs to that 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 clearly needs to include skills and uh, clear skills and supply chain. Um, I think we have a government that's more philosophically inclined towards enabling than being heavy handed. Um, but we also have a government that seems to be quite happy to throw away shibboleths of, of kind of, you know, party political dogma whenever it um, uh, might help to get the job done. And what I'm thinking about in this regard is, is, is the, the kind of much more active industrial policy that they seem to be uh, enthusiastic about pursuing than, than their predecessors either side of the centre line, if you like, where uh, active industrial policy had been seen to be a terrible disaster of the 1970s. And it seems as though finally, kind of 45 years later, we get past that. And if that's done right, then that could be hugely enabling uh, of this uh, transition. It could also help to address some of the regional and geographical inequalities around this that I've already mm -hmm. uh, mentioned. Um, so I'm slightly going to dodge the question as to whether they need to be more heavy handed with, with companies, but I think that they need to be very, very much more uh, interventionist and ambitious because um, you know, this is a, an yeah. incredibly big challenge. Okay, right. Um, Rianne, don't answer that if you can, because I, I want to try and get some through these questions. There's a, a, there's a great question in from Brian Morrison here. Seems to be a few organisations working the skills gap, like Optico Energy Skills Alliance. Also, there's a European initiative doing something similar. So lots of bits, and it's not clear if they're speaking. Um, can you confirm whether the Green Jobs Task Force has been reaching out and talking to all the other groups? It absolutely has. I've been really impressed, actually, at how many people it has talked to. And, and it's not um, it is in no way intended to be an inclusive group. It's been as in, uh, uh, an exclusive group. So it's intended it was they've been very inclusive. And I don't think uh, when it produces its report, it's going to be the end of the story either. So I think there's a role for everybody and they recognise that and want everybody to be part of it. Yeah, but there's unquestionably, which is why I wanted to get the question asked, there's you know, a, a concern I always have about lack of coordination in this space. So if we come come back to uh, Sebastian Belcher put a question up earlier about um, how can skills and awareness be built outside of the energy industry? Uh, we need everyone to play a part, but often training is only done in STEM subjects. How can we increase outside engagement, build potentially non-work related skills at net zero? It's a good question, Sebastian. Um, but, but I do think there's an awful lot still to do on STEM. So there's a, there's a lot of work going on in the Royal Academy of Engineering, Engineering UK, producing materials, because I think there was a question from someone about uh, what materials are available for schools. Uh, the Careers and Enterprise Company that is a government funded body that ensures there's uh, a business person associated with every secondary school and college in England. So that's about 4,000 now um, in, in place called Enterprise advisors and trying to produce materials to the industry that they can make sure are, are getting into the schools. But, but as Rob says, uh, I think the uh, agenda to a certain extent is a local one as well. So trying to actually create the visibility for people about the sort of jobs that are likely to exist in their local uh, neighborhoods. As you think about 
back to the industrial policy and where the hydrogen hubs might be, where the CCUS hubs might be, et cetera, where the wind turbine manufacturing plants already are and, and so on and so forth. But all, all of the comments that are implicit in the questions, I, I think are completely right about, let's make sure that we really join this stuff up, which is what the energy minister says in her introduction to the barometer, interestingly. Scott Border says the core skills remain unchanged, came in, but need to be applied to the new problem. Uh, I guess that's agreeing with what I said earlier, Scott. I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's not not as big a reskilling as some people would bear. Patrick McMurray, McMurray rather, uh, OSPR, we're the Trade Association for Offshore Energy Workers, and we're finding that our members do face a real challenge in transitioning from offshore oil and gas to offshore renewables. That's counter to some of the the stories I've been picking up recently. Uh, just says, I guess there's more work to do there. What, what, what conversations have you been having on the, on, on the task force about, about the interplay to get into education and what I was just talking about in terms of the careers and enterprise company and things, Rian? So we've spent quite a lot of time talking about how do you embed um, net zero into the curriculum? How do you engage the right teachers? Do you have champions in schools? How, my point in, when I, in my opening comments, how do you engage people around schools? Um, then also, how do you have pull through all the way through the education system? So if you start in sort of, you know, primary school, how do you engage people in secondary education? Um, not dissimilar to the conversations I think many of us have been having for a long time around what's the role for STEM, but at least pitching it around net zero. And um, and I think one of the things that we note at National Grid with some of the research we've done is there's quite a lot of excitement around net zero. I mean, there's a lot of um, young people who do want to do something meaningful. So we need how do we harness that and link it to STEM? But we've also looked at how do you create the right PhDs so that they're focused on the sort of pulling through the sort of innovation that we think we'll need so yeah actually quite a lot of the conversation has been um, around uh, how do you embed this in the education system and you know I, I guess some um, there's no silver bullet so I, you know if you if you've been worrying about STEM for a while um, then I don't think we're going to come up with anything new but I think there's a moment in time where perhaps it has more resonance and it may, it may we may need to carry the momentum through. Yeah thank you very much and thanks thanks for your comments Rianne and Rob this morning let me just uh, if I can make a couple of closing comments so if, you know um, please do read the barometer first of all um, you know it's pretty pretty clear from the survey that decarbonisation is not going to happen at the speed and scale without the workforce we're not the first people to say that quite clearly uh, but hopefully it's going to be helpful in, in getting in, into that debate and getting into this issue of making sure uh, as indeed the industrial strategy did comment about here's a strategy but you can't have that in isolation without a skills strategy to go alongside it and we absolutely need to get a net zero skills strategy in place soon we know that the lead times of, of, of developing those skills are long as well. So that's why I think we want to make sure that we're using the barometer to uh, up the ante in terms of pace. And it's got to start in schools. And you know, as I remarked earlier, there's been so much focus on STEM for such a long time, so much focus on getting non-traditional people into the energy industry. And I agree with what you just said, Rianne. This is a real opportunity in a sense of something that excites people to, to converse with the young generation back, you know, come and join the industry and be part of solving the issues that, that we have to solve. And that's not just in the new industry companies, that's also come and join the oil and gas companies in their journey as they start to uh, think about the businesses that they're gonna be in the future. And, and of course, the whole agenda with the leveling up agenda and just transition, you know, I'm so pleased that everyone here this morning has sort of asked questions around that as well. And I think I'm, I'm involved. There's a real opportunity to make sure that we do that at the same time. So the key thing is just making sure this is all joined up in a sense. So thank you for joining us today. I hope that in the brief time you've uh, enjoyed some of the insights from Rob and Rianne. Uh, as I said, do, do have a look at the barometer. There's a recording of the webinar that will be circulated later and is available on the YouTube channel as well. And as I said, this report is interactive. So please take a bit of time to dig into some of the findings in a bit more detail and do let us know. Please feed us back on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever or, uh, or tag us to let us know what you think about the report. This again has got a long way to run. Um, we are looking forward to the issue of the Green Task Force report 
and its recommendations, and we will certainly, as an institute, uh, be in this space for a long time to come, I'm sure. But thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Robrian. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. Take care.